Um, so let me skip that for now. Um, so there is this map of the local group in your book, but I want to walk through it one piece at a time because I find this figure to be extremely confusing. So let me try to make more sense out of that. So in this map, basically, um, the Milky Way galaxy is plotted here as this orange point. Uh, there should be a word that says spirals here. All the orange points are supposed to be spiral galaxies on this map. Um, and the, uh, I guess, radius of this circle is 950,000 light years. And so now if I look outward from the Milky Way galaxy and then down out of the plane, then I will find the, um, the small Magellanic cloud. So that's a picture of the SMC. And if I do that again, going outward and down, then I find the LMC relatively nearby. And since these are both located um, some distance away from us and also under this you know, imaginary plane that we're drawing around the Milky Way, then we see them in the same area of the sky, right? These are both visible from the Southern hemisphere only. So the SMC and LMC, they're relatively nearby. Um, these I don't think should be drawn as orange dots because they're not really spiral galaxies, but I guess since they're kind of companions of the Milky Way, they are, they're drawn in orange with the Milky Way. Okay, moving on to some farther field neighbors. If we go out and then up, then we find um, this Andromeda II elliptical galaxy. And if we go out and up again, there's another elliptical galaxy, Ursa Minor. And kind of nearby in all these different areas, some above and some below this plane that we've drawn, are a whole bunch of other elliptical galaxies. So Leo, Leo Sextans, Forna, Carina, Sculptor, Tucana, these are all named after the, um, the constellation that they're found within, right? That's the naming convention for galaxies. So this is kind of our, our neighborhood. And then there's a couple of um, irregular galaxies here drawn in red. And if you think of this entire area that we've just been considering and then shrink it down, then this is what the bottom half of this map is showing us. So now the Milky Way and all of its little elliptical and irregular friends are down here at the center of this 5.5 million light year circle. And now if we consider what are the other kind of larger neighbors in this group, then we can find the Andromeda galaxy here, as well as its two satellites, M32 and M110, which are both elliptical. And then if we look outward, kind of in a similar direction as Andromeda, we find the Triangulum Galaxy M33. So this is another large spiral, but not quite as large as the Milky Way or Andromeda. And also there are a handful of other galaxies like the irregular NGC 6822. And if you look at the entire map together, um, we can kind of pull a few pieces of information out of this right away. The first is that um, the entire local group, it's about 3 million light years across. Its total mass is 4 trillion times the mass of the sun. And it has 60 total members. Um, the three large spirals are Milky Way, Andromeda, and M33 Triangulum. Um, there's two sort of intermediate mass elliptical galaxies. And then there's a whole bunch of dwarf and irregulars. So all these other blue and red um, wedges indicate all of those smaller members. So most of the mass is taken up by the Milky Way and Andromeda. Um, I think like 50% of the mass and the rest of it is distributed among the many, many other members. So that's our local group. We've talked about it before, but now you've gotten to know it in a little bit more detail. And I hope now you can make use of this map in the book. There's a few other clusters that are nearby the local group. So our local group is small. That's why it's called a group instead of a cluster. So there are only about 60 galaxies, but Virgo nearby has thousands of galaxies and the Coma cluster has 10,000. Um, so because of their different numbers of galaxies, of course they have very different masses. Virgo is about a hundred times more massive than the local group and then the Coma cluster a thousand times. So it basically scales as the number of galaxies, even though there's dark matter as well, that contributes to those totals. Um, there are different sizes, of course. And um, the, the sort of location, uh, the 
I guess, central point of these is also quite different. So in the local group, the center, like the, I guess you would see, say geographic center, I guess, of it is between Milky Way and Andromeda. So there's nothing there. But in both the Virgo cluster and the Coma cluster, there are giant ellipticals at or near their center. So for the Virgo cluster, there's just one giant elliptical. That's the thing that's dominating this image. And for the Coma cluster, there's two giant ellipticals near the center. So we've talked about galaxy evolution, merging, creating ellipticals. And now you can see you know, how that actually plays out within galaxy clusters. It creates these big giant ellipticals at the centers of clusters. All right, so um, the end of structure does not end with clusters. There are also superclusters. So here's the supercluster, uh, the Virgo supercluster that contains our local group, which is just the tiny dot at the very center of this scale. Here's the Virgo cluster we just discussed. Um, I think coma is farther off the page here. Um, and the definition of supercluster is a little bit in flux. So um, there's some definitions that say that the Virgo supercluster is also a smaller member within this larger one called Laniakea. And I mean, this is an evolving science as we continue to map out galaxies. Okay, so who are the people mapping out the galaxies? Well, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is the biggest um, part of this effort. Um, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation funds them and they look in five different wavelength bands. We'll come back to these different wavelength bands in the activity on Wednesday. And they've got lots of other projects going on besides mapping galaxies, but they've looked at many millions of stars and galaxies within their different projects. Um, and this is only about 35% of the sky. So there's still a lot of surveying that could be continued. Um, the whole look back time that they can get to is more than 11 billion years. So, you know, that's only 2 billion years away from the entire beginning of the universe, which is awesome. So note that they looked at quasars for some of the um, most distant observations of galaxies and their locations. So hopefully you're starting to see how all the things that we've been learning about are kind of coming together into this mapping effort. All right, so some of the things that they're doing is measuring specific properties of all those galaxies, like their shapes and their colors. Um, they're also measuring um, stars in the Milky Way so that we can try to find the traces of a former satellite galaxy that has been cannibalized. Um, they're looking at extrasolar planets, asteroids in the asteroid belt, but most importantly for our purposes, they're creating a map of galaxy location at different redshifts. So this is what we mean when we say a map of large scale structure and lots of times this is called a redshift survey because what we're doing is taking a survey of galaxies and measuring all of their redshifts. There's a couple of different methods that you can use when you're you know, wanting to make a map of galaxies. You could either take a, what we call a pie slice, so that's a wide view of galaxies, or a pencil beam survey, which is a very narrow view. And my question for you is, um, which of these survey types um, would you be able to see farther with all right, I don't really expect you to know the answer to this question. Um, so I just wanted you to stake out a claim here. I see a slight preference for pencil beam. And that's right. So the big difference between these kinds of surveys is the amount of time that it takes to gather all the data, right? So if let's say that you wanted to take a photograph of some sort of mountain range, right? Um, there's a couple different ways you could do it. You could take you know, a bunch of photographs and stitch them together. Um, right? So you would have to take, I guess, a lot of images, or you would have to take those images more quickly and stitch them together to get a wider image. But if you wanted to see really far, then you'd want to set a very um, long time to gather as much light as possible. I guess if you've ever tried to do astrophotography at night and, um, you know, take images where you can actually see stars, then you have to set a longer time to take your photo, right? Otherwise, it'll be uh, dominated by all the nearby light. But if you let there be more time while your shutter is open, then you'll gather all of that dim light from the stars and they'll start to show up. Okay, so for that reason, the pencil beam survey can um, see farther away simply because it has the chance to gather more light 
Whereas if you're doing a pie slice survey, um, you take shorter time scale images of many locations. So it has a shorter redshift range, but you're getting a wider area. So that's the trade off. Um, when we look at the SDSS map here, you can fly through it in 3D on YouTube if you want. Um, notice the range of redshifts go from 0.02 to 0.14. And what is this redshift scale actually telling you? What is the interesting information that you can extract from it? Okay, so I see a lot of C and also a lot of A. And C was what I had in mind. The redshift does directly tell you the distance of these galaxies from our observing position here on Earth. Um, but A, you're kind of on the right track that, you know, it is also related to our look back time, right? Which can tell us about the age of the universe when those galaxies were, were um, sending us the light that we're finally receiving. But that doesn't in itself tell you necessarily the age of the galaxies in a very direct way. So it tells you the look back time, which tells you about the age of the universe that you're seeing it at then, but you don't know exactly when that galaxy formed relative to when it's sending the light that you're receiving. So it's a little bit of a fine point, but I'd say you're like, you're halfway right with A. Um, but I had in mind C that we're using redshift simply as a proxy for distance. All right, so that comes back to this um, table that we've seen before. And if we consider um, some of the, the basic range of redshifts that we're seeing here, um, 0.14, let's round it up to 0.2. And we're looking between you know, 0.1 and 0.2 at these farthest reaching galaxies in our survey. Um, those are around you know, several thousands of millions of light years. So that's around up to about 2 billion light years. So for a sense of scale, you can assume that that's about the um, the radius of this circle is a 2 billion light year radius. All right, so some of the things to notice on this redshift map is just how the galaxies are distributed, right? Um, we see clumps of galaxies that kind of form these filament structures around these empty voids. So it seems like they're kind of on the edges of giant bubbles is where all the galaxies like to live. So my filaments are all the red and green things in the graph. The voids you can highlight in blue, they tend to have fairly characteristic um, size scales, right? It looks like all the bubbles are reasonably similar sizes. And that size turns out to be about 150 million light years in diameter. And while the voids take about 50% of the total volume of this survey, they only contain about 5 to 10% of the mass. So those voids are indeed pretty empty. And as I showed on the, on the very first slide of my picture of the day, um, those voids don't contain very much dark matter either. Most of the dark matter is also along these filaments. So that suggests to us that perhaps there's a connection between why the dark matter is in the filaments and why the regular matter is in the filaments. All right, the other thing that we can extract from this map is that the ideas of the cosmological principle do seem to hold. So if we look at um, different regions, as long as we're looking at regions that are the same size, then we see relatively similar numbers of galaxies within each region. And no matter which direction we um, point our cone of vision, we see a relatively similar distribution in all directions. So on these largest length scales, the universe does in fact look homogeneous and isotropic but only on sufficiently large scales. So which property, again, just to review, are these circles trying to point out? I see far and away the most votes for A. Yes, those are um, homogeneity. So those are similar size region in space that contain similar numbers of galaxies. All right, so that's our Final conclusion there. Um, yes, so there are a couple of caveats that I should mention. First of all, um, there's you know motion within the universe, so the number of galaxies in a given number or a given volume can change over time. Um, the second thing is that um, various regions have different um, 
they have similar numbers of galaxies, but they can have different numbers at different distances. And to show you this, I've drawn a few other different color images. So nearby, we see different numbers of galaxies than far away. Some of this, you know, you would, if you're just reading the map, then you would assume that this is actually a physical fact. But some of this is just due to the fact that it's difficult to measure those very distant galaxies. So it's hard to say based on these galaxy surveys that there is actually a lower density of galaxies at high redshift. Um, it's just not exactly a question that these maps are equipped to answer without additional analysis. So those are my technical caveats. Okay, so now I hope that you're um, tantalized as to why this structure exists. It seems weird. It seems like a different shape than other shapes that we've encountered in space, which are mostly spheres or things that move in circles. This is decidedly not a bunch of spheres and things moving in circles. So what the heck happened? 